and a Ford friend getting gentrified. Mark's in the house, about to tell you why. What up, y'all? Welcome to Marks in the House. Last week, we looked at the role imperialism plays in the global gentrification scheme, specifically the labor aristocracy. This class of people, like everyone under capitalism, is very depressed and hates their lives, even with that fat-ass extra paycheck. Why are we all so depressed under capitalism? Because it's a dehumanizing system. It alienates us from everything. Gentrifiers gentrify, not only because of the sound financial investment, but in a feeble attempt to combat this alienation somewhat. But in mainstream media, neither economics nor alienation are named. Let's take a look at this clip. Mariachi Square is the heart of Boyle Heights, a solidly Hispanic neighborhood that in the past saw waves of immigrants. There was Irish, Italians, Jewish, Russians, Japanese, you name it, they all lived here. This was like an Ellis Island of the West. The latest wave is wealthier, mostly white artists and professionals attracted by proximity to downtown LA and public transit. Their art galleries, shops, and gourmet cafes have been popping up steadily. Now in this clip, it says that the first wave of gentrifiers is attracted to the neighborhood because of art galleries and its proximity to public transportation. Does that sound familiar? Bourgeois explanations of gentrification are vague. They treat it like it's a chaotic concept, like it's all these different small reasons that together make up gentrification on equal terms. No, we at Marx and the House know better. There's a primary reason and secondary reasons. The primary is economic, the secondary, cultural. Gentrifiers can be attracted to an area for lots of different reasons. In the 70s, researchers said that rising gas prices and higher bus fares caused gentrification. People wanted to live closer to work. Or they said gentrification happened because people wanted easy access to culture downtown. Or better yet, because they wanted to escape some type of oppression. Now when I say that the primary reason is economic, it's not that secondary elements are unimportant. But think of it like this. As a gentrifier, you can be attracted to an area for all types of reasons. But if there's no economic benefit, you wouldn't buy a crib. I mean, why the fuck would you buy a house expecting to lose money? The reason people move into these neighborhoods is because old properties can be bought and rehabilitated at a lower price than buying a brand new house. That's the core of it. It's only when you delve into secondary elements that shit gets trickier. During World War II, a lot of gay white people were dishonorably charged and pretty much got dumped in San Francisco. Relatively better off than black and brown people, they looked to make a neighborhood that was of their own, where they wouldn't face queerphobic repression. The same reason sparked white LGBTQ gentrification in Brooklyn and New Orleans. In Harlem, it was the black labor aristocracy that slowly started to get a piece of the American pie. They didn't fit in with the white people in Manhattan, so a lot moved to Harlem to get in touch with their black roots. But even amongst the black community, they found that class antagonisms were still at play. But of course, cishet white people are a main force of gentrification. And for them, their identity doesn't play a major, obvious role. So I'd say that for the labor aristocracy and the petty bourgeoisie as a whole, the secondary reason for gentrification is an effort to combat capitalist alienation. Gentrifiers want the excitement and diversity they think comes with an urban lifestyle, but a sanitized, suburbanized, and whitened version of it. During the gentrification of the Lower East Side, a resident said, These yuppie-ass money-having, culture-seeking white people are buying us poor people out of our neighborhood, in part because they want a taste of our culture, rich environment, and the more of them come in, the more of us forced to leave because we can't longer afford to live here. Gentrifiers sanitize working-class culture and destroy it. Working-class black and brown people spray graffiti, they get arrested. But after a neighborhood gets gentrified, the same piece of graffiti gets hung up on a plaque in a coffee shop because it's hip. All within legal bounds, of course. This is the spiritual side of gentrification. We're finally ready to talk about alienation. Let's take a closer look at what this means. Now, when you think of work, you probably think of your two full-time jobs and how much you hate them. But listen, we're creative beings. We like to make shit. That's the essence of our humanity, our creative drive to produce a different world around us. Now, when capitalism was the new kid around the block, most of our ancestors were farmers. I'm gonna explain this in the most simplistic terms. Alienation and its historical context are a huge topic, so obviously, this is simplified. All right. Let's take a farmer living in India. They have their own land, which produces enough to sustain themselves. Life isn't perfect, of course. Farming is hard fucking work and life is exhausting. But 
at least this farmer is in control of their production. Let's say they're lucky and not only do they own their own plot of land, but also their own seeds and tools. Nowadays, this is a very rare occurrence, but like I said, this farmer is lucky. In their off time, when there's not a lot of work to be done, they make sweaters together with their family for a little extra income. They also control this process from start to finish. They don't just finish off one part of the sweater and then hand it to the next worker. They make the whole thing themselves. Just like they can say the harvest is of their own production, so is the sweater. But then, a big company comes through and buys their land and that of their neighbors. Next thing you know, they're getting evicted because they're occupying it illegally. The farmer first says no, but then the company kills off a bunch of people from the village, so they oblige. Now the farmer has lost their land, aka their means of subsistence. Now, in order to survive in capitalism, you have to sell something, right? Good old MCM. Or, da 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 da, CMC. You sell a commodity, you get money, and you buy more commodities. Not nowhere near as fancy as MCM, trust. But wait a second, you don't own any land. And you also don't own any means to produce anything, aka you don't own any means of production. But wait a second, there's one commodity you do own. Your labor power, aka your ability to work for a capitalist. So this farmer has to go to a place where they can sell their labor power. Other villages on the countryside? Fuck no, that's not where their jobs are at. So this farmer goes to the slums right outside a big village in search of a company to work for. This farmer has officially been proletarianized. There's a Nike factory nearby constantly in search of new employees because the workers there don't grow too old. So now this farmer sells their labor power as a commodity to the owner of this Nike company. What do they do there? They make sweaters. Now what they produce in their village and what they produce in the factory is essentially the same, right? But the conditions under which they're doing so is greatly different. In their own home, they decided what to do with the sweater. It was the outcome of their creative impulse and they decided where it would end up. They had control over the whole process. Am I gonna give it to my kids? Am I gonna wear it myself? Am I gonna sell it on the market? Again, this is an oversimplification because a lot of times, of course, they would need to sell it. But there's choice. And this control over what you produce is essential to being human. In the factory, as a worker, they most likely just do one repetitive action over and over to thousands of sweaters every day. And what they produce, they simply give away. To who? To their boss. They don't have any control over the production process, and as soon as they've produced it, they've lost it. In other words, their creative power, the thing that makes them actually human, creates something that is not theirs. In fact, what they produce is alienated from them. And these are the general labor conditions under capitalism. What we produce in return for wages is alienated from us. But that's not the only thing. Because of fucked up capitalist ideology, we're also alienated from ourselves. Because we see ourselves as nothing but a commodity in terms of our productivity. And then we're alienated from others because of patriarchy and racism and seeing others as competition on the labor market and all this fucking crap. Human beings are social creatures with creative impulses. But capitalism messes up our social relations to others and our creativity. Because of this, we're all sad, depressed, lonely, and fucking anxious all the time. And this is where advertising comes in. Not only did capitalists create the conditions for all this to happen, but also the conditions to reproduce it. Because they're making us believe that the only way to fill this void in our hearts is to buy more commodities. The more commodities we want to buy, the more they can produce. The more commodities are produced, the more capital can circulate. Catch my drift? Now the more capital circulates in an area, the harder capitalists go on advertising. So the more capital started to circulate within real estate, the more it needed to sell home ownership or dope ass interior designs as the essence of fulfillment. All your problems would be solved if only you'd own a home or have this color wallpaper. The reason why the labor aristocracy is such a driving force behind gentrification is because of a double whammy. On the one hand, they're alienated from their labor and still seek to find meaning in real estate. Fixing up an old home or moving into a sketchy neighborhood gives a sense of thrill and access to proletarian culture that's usually denied to the labor aristocracy. But of course, the problem is that the void never gets filled. 
And that's of course because actual proletarian culture disappears with displacement. But funny enough, the process continues, and then the labor aristocracy in turn get displaced. As more and more capital circulates, eventually nothing but bourgeois millionaires can afford it, as in certain sections of Manhattan right now. And on top of all that, the alienation actually deepens. Displacing other people, of course, strengthens your alienation from them. Liberals are caught in a bind, wanting everybody to have housing, but also supporting the capital movement that makes this impossible. And this contradiction creates an alienated world outlook as well. Now, I'm not trying to paint the labor aristocracy somehow being the victims of gentrification. They're not. They're on the front lines dispossessing working class people. But at the same time, they're also victims of capitalism and must be won over to a united front to destroy it. Well, next week is our last and final episode. Thank you so much for going on this crazy fucking ride with me. Thank you for all your support and love. Peace, space baby out.